Okay, we are live. So hi, everyone, and welcome back to Holy Humanist. Um, I'm back here again for part three on, I guess, do you think you know Sharia? Think again. Or if you don't know Sharia, you're in for a hell of a surprise. But either way, we're going to be carrying on the series where we unpack Sharia. Um, and so we have the one and only Lloyd back with us. Thank you, Lloyd, yeah. for being here at such um like last minute no not obviously I always give you last minute's notice I know we both have crazy lives so I apologize and I apologize to the viewers um so obviously if people are coming in slowly and joining across this stream it will go on for about 90 minutes as we usually do um just because we think that's like a good amount of time to to convey enough information without being too overwhelming and um, I think it breaks up the series nicely into parts as well which again is more digestible um, but yeah, so without further ado, and I always say that and then create further ado. So literally without further ado, um, Lloyd, welcome back again. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, no, thank you. Always uh, a pleasure. And yeah, I did put the time aside. We did say maybe, you know, maybe, mon maybe Monday, maybe <laughs> Wednesday, maybe Thursday. So I kind of left it open so <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I really appreciate that and here we are here we are well we've got some we've got an hour or two spare in our day why not discuss sharia in front of the masses <laughs> yeah. um but yeah no thank you for being here thank you to everybody who is up and showed up in the house this early Ishan Shah thank you for being here Ross Temple welcome Josie Wales always nice to see you Yippee, uh, welcome, thank you for being here. Grey Jedi as well. And yours truly was first. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so Lloyd, again, where I guess if you want to carry on from where we left off Let's last off. time, or you want to yeah. give kind of more of an introduction into where you want today's like um, um, segment headed, it's entirely up to you. Um, well, we're continuing with the Sharia, so we're doing a, a more academic overview today uh we may skip over sections that we've covered in the first section because we did cover some of that already so i might just do a more cursory overview of some of this stuff um, sure. although i do find it doesn't hurt to repeat some things because it actually helps to reinforce it people do forget and it, and it helps to them um, to have a second and third um review because you know, they remember better and sure. it makes more sense and uh yeah so we'll do some more of that. And of course, we'll take questions. And then we, we do tend to meander a little bit, which is great, <laughs> yeah. you know, questions. And, and uh, obviously, the audience, if there's questions, we'll be happy to to try and take those and, and answer those. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. hopefully. But we, we generally will be covering uh, what Sharia is, where mm -hmm. it is found, what books, what the doctrine, where the doctrine comes from. And then, of course, the historical development. So we can see its historical development within its political context, because really, it, it's got a very strong political context to it. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, wow. And Abdul was complaining about Ben Harris's channel. That's interesting. That's so <laughs> funny. Ishan Shah is saying, ironically, I first heard about Lloyd because an Abdul was complaining about him on Harris's channel. <laughs> oh, wow. Lloyd, your reach has extended far and wide now, my friend. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, I, I honestly think um, because more and more people contact me now and more and more people are... Um, are using my material more and more people right. are saying this makes sense this this is so much more detailed than the quran it's it actually explains it, it lays it out neatly it explains everything so you can answer everything so yeah, yeah I, I see it used more and more and i see more and more people and i and i i see more and more the the abduls as he says i mean those are the the, the youtube commenters who you know the propagandists mm -hmm. they are retreating into literally just copy paste copy paste copy paste mm -hmm. and it's you you see less and less rational argumentation from them so I, I think it's causing it's it's causing well it's having an effect yeah I was gonna say is it a copy paste of the comments or a copy paste of the arguments because either way it's it's abysmal really um no. but yeah no and, and I'm not surprised at all Lloyd like when when you've kind of put this information together and like collected it in such a way where like even your google drive just to have something as succinct as the Encyclopedia of Islam, where it's a matter of you type in any word and you can see what how Islam perceives that. That is powerful. That is extremely yeah. powerful, especially for the lay Muslim who has just been kind of fed that chain of lies from the hierarchy of their imams or the local sheikhs or whoever. 
But to actually have access to these documents is a game changer. I truly believe that. And uh, it literally, it's as simple as having access to their own sources. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Anyway. Actually, you just, you just made me think of something. Actually, I'm going to make a quick change to my PowerPoint. If you don't sure. mind, I just want to add something because this will be relevant. Sure. And uh, Ross Temple is saying, I've been pointing people to Lloyd's teachings to understand the insanity. Yeah, no, thank you, Lloyd. Uh, sorry, thank you, Ross. Exactly. Because, I mean, this is, we really, really need to appreciate when, you know, you have actual original sources and you have them archived um, and put together in such a way where it's so accessible to the masses and people can just read for themselves and come to their own conclusions because even in, in Islam, I think somebody talked about this in a previous stream, I can't like replace the person, but it's very much a case of, I think it might've been you actually Lloyd that said Islam prioritizes um, the, the sources that they need to translate dependent yes. on the country and dependent on that. So it, it yeah. makes sense that actually, there's- I'll show you an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah so go yes. Ahead, yeah, because they, there's, there's, there's so many of these books. So they have had to say which of these books, because look, 85, 86, 87% of Muslims don't speak Arabic. They speak yeah. English, right? Or other languages, right? The most populous is Islamic countries speak no Arabic. Right, you're looking at Malaysia and Pakistan, or Indonesia and Pakistan, yeah. right? So, so, but, but mostly the the, the lingua franca is really English. Mm -hmm. So, the, so they have prioritized the a hundred volumes, a hundred books that needed to get into English, right? And which was the first one, the first major one? Well, Reliance of the Traveler. Yeah. Right. Why would they put all that effort into it if it wasn't relevant? And then, of course, the Quran, and of course, the Hadiths. But then after that. The Sharia Manual, like Reliance of the Traveler, was one of the very first ones. Actually, I will bring up one more because you've just made me think of a good reason to show you exactly how this process works. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, Sean, that is horrific. You that operate. is. Yeah, this is the, um, the Heavenly Ornaments book. Obviously, this is what is used a lot more predominantly in, in like the subcon Asian subcontinent countries like Pakistan, for example. And Lloyd and I have shared material from this, and it's honestly truly, truly horrific. Um, the level of detail it goes into in terms of having sex with minors and things like that and what's permissible and what to do if some, a certain something ruptures. It is truly, truly horrendous. You would not think that that's ever some material that's considered divine or let alone relied on. Um, so, yeah, no, that's... I'm sure we're going to come across a lot more in this series as well. Like I have got my seatbelt fastly tightened. Um, Josie Wells is also okay. saying Lloyd's knowledge is incredible and his ability to teach us the real Islamic ideology to us. What a superstar. Yeah, no, Thanks, thank man. you. Appreciate totally it. agree. Okay. So, yeah, so maybe we can start on that point because you always ask very good questions and you always make really pertinent statements. So I think that's a really good point that oh, you just you. raised. So can we start on this one then? Sure. Okay. For instance, this is called the Kitab al-Siyar al-Sagir. Okay. Yeah. Let me just put it up. The book. Okay. Now I will... I will, so this notice 100 great books of Islamic civilization. So I believe this is an effort of the Pakistani government. And they were saying, hey, look, we need to prioritize the top 100 books. Right. Right. And this is one of them. So this is one of these books. So they are, So if you look, I mean, you'll find there's a couple of these efforts to to prioritize certain books and say, look, these need to get into English so we can make this this common knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. Across the Islamic world. Common knowledge for Muslims, not for you. So, yeah, exactly, precisely. And this is called Muslim international law. Notice it's not it's not Pakistani international law. It's not yeah. Greek international law. It's not French inter it's Muslim international law. International mm -hmm. law for the Muslim nation. The Ummah is a nation, right? Above and beyond the nation you live in, right? Because exactly. Yeah, you think about that, which tells you Islam's political entity. And this is called the Kitab al Siyat al Sagib. Now let's actually go to the Hedaya. Now the Hedaya. I'm going to go here for a moment. So the Hedaya is the, this is the, this is the major Sharia manual for the Hanafi school of fiqh. Okay. This is the major, the Hedaya, right? And I am not going to go to, I think it's page 145. So I'm just going to start on that. Mm -hmm. And we'll just have a look at this idea of, we'll go a little further. 
just so that we can get an idea of what siyat is. Okay, so this is from the major. So I said, so remember the Hanafis are the biggest school of you know madhab within Islam, and mm -hmm. and this is the major manual within that madhab. And let's have a look at siyat. Okay, mm -hmm. so siyat is the plural of sirat, which in its primitive sense signifies regulation, but in mat in matters spiritual and temporal. But in the language of the law, it applies to the institutes of the Prophet in his wars. Okay, wow, that's, that escalated very quickly. Well, okay, we did. in the language and of the so we'll see. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on, go, please. No, 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 uh, sorry, I was, I was just trying to take in what I've just read <laughs> all of a sudden because I was like, did that escalate as quickly as mm. I imagined? But yes, it has. So, so you see here immediately that, that Islam is a religion of peace because it's about warfare. And we're going to learn a lot about this. You're going to see, for instance, we have, okay, on the manner of waging war, because Islam's a religion of peace, right? Yes. And then of plunder and the division thereof. Now, now I, I know they are, I, I believe plunder is something that pirates do. Yes, indeed, Lloyd. You're right. I mean, is it something you think of when you think of a prophet who is receiving divine revelation from a god that he needs How to go to out and plunder? Plunder, loot, and rape, and pillage. <laughs> oh, yeah, you seem to understand this very, very well. And the conquest of infidels, right? And then, of course, you have on the laws concerning, but now let's just read the very first. Uh, so this is all about the siyar, okay, and war. So let's just briefly have a look at what they say. War must be carried on against the infidels at all times by some party of the Muslims. Wow, right? okay. Okay, must be carried on at all times. This is why it's a small minority. So a small minority must carry on warfare at all times. Now, the sacred injunction concerning war is sufficiently observed when it is carried on by any one party or tribe of Muslims, and it is then no longer of any force with respect to the rest. As long as some Muslims are going around stabbing people in the eye on London Bridge, mm. the rest can sit back and you know, watch TV and sip their Coke on the couch because someone's busy doing the, you know. Right. So if someone's dirty. busy out trying to get Salman Rushdie, all the other Muslims can sit back and not condemn it because he's going out and doing the good work that he's meant to be doing Correct. for all of them. Because, you see, so it is established as a divine ordinance. This is a command, a divine <laughs> ordinance by Allah, who said in the Quran, slay the infidels. And also by a saying of the prophet, war is permanently established until the day of judgment right wow. so notice war is enjoined it is commanded for the purpose of advancing the true faith which is islam so right. islam is commanded in the sharia to be spread by warfare and and sorry and this, Louis, just because it's enjoined is like i'm sorry that's when i hear that word like it's literally part and parcel of the purpose of advancing the true faith so whether it's dawah you're doing whether it's you know trying to spread islam through other means or whatever in order to be a good Muslim and advance your faith, you are literally supposed to have this mentality of perpetual war. Yes, correct. I, I can go to multiple. This, okay, the Hadaya is the most detailed of the Sharia manuals. So typically when an Imam finishes his three years or five years or seven years or whatever the heck he's doing to, be, to, to become an Imam or a Qadi, a judge, a Sheikh who can, who can do fatwas, this is usually the final manual or very often the final manual that he will study as the most detailed of the Sharia manuals. So you see, and also notice, jihad fad, okay, or ordained war is enjoined in various passages of the Quran to be waged against infidel. It is termed the holy war. There's no such thing as holy war in Islam, though, except it is in the Sharia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the other Islam, devoid of the Sharia, it means uh, work on yourself spiritually. <laughs> it's yeah, the holy war yeah. inside. <laughs> yeah, well, but, uh, since we're here, yeah, since we're yeah. here, I may as well look at some of that stuff, just since we are here. Mm. You see, as long as some party of Muslims are making war, it is no longer binding upon the rest, okay? If no Muslims were to make war, the whole of Islam, the entire Ummah, would incur the criminality of neglecting it. There's collective punishment if there's a lack of jihad going on. If All no Muslim Muslims is out there, yeah. If there's no Muslim out there, according to this Hidayah, committing violence or atrocities against the infidel in, in pursuit of their true faith, then all Muslims, the entire Ummah is held accountable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. correct. Um, so I don't want to go too far, but notice here, okay, I want you to be very clear about this passage. I'm not, this, if I do, if we do a show specifically on jihad, then I will cover this in detail. 
right? Sure. Jihad and the Demis, okay, and the Jizya. Mm. Uh, people will be shocked. I mean, th that is mind-numbingly brazen, what they say there. But the destruction of the sword is incurred by infidels. That's you, in case you were wondering. Are you Muslim? No, then that's you. Although they be not the first aggressors, as appears from various passages in the sacred writings, which are received to this effect. Infidels <laughs> may be attacked without... Oopsie, sorry about that. Let me just... That's uh, okay. Make it as big as you need to. What? Infidel may be attacked without provocation. And then, Lloyd, Muslim apologists have the audacity to tell you that every single war was fought out of like self-defense. They were never the aggressors. Yet you're you're commanded. <laughs> 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 Kill the polytheists wherever you find them. Da da da. Like your commanders. That. That's okay. But yeah, yeah, again, this is a pro-aggressive stance Islam is oh. taking here. This is yeah. this is uh, yeah. Yeah. So so this is Islam. So understand. So let's just quickly go back to this Shebani's Kitab Al Siyar Al Sagir. Okay. Sometimes you'll see As A S. I mean, whatever. Blah blah blah. So this is Shabani, one of the top scholars of Islam. And of course, uh, at this point, suddenly he's not a true Muslim and he goes right under the bus, as we all know. <laughs> yeah, right? surprise, Notice surprise. The, yeah. So the plan for publishing an English translation of 100 important books of Islamic thought, culture, and civilization was formally approved by the Pakistan Council. Now the Pakistanis suddenly don't become real Muslims. <laughs> yeah. Which, which works, which laid the foundation of a new faith come knowledge-based civilization and the books that have mattered in advancement of knowledge. Ooh, oh, so this a is one. Manual matters, right? In yeah, the, the book should be a pioneering one. It should be the most advanced work, the greatest <laughs> impact on the area of knowledge, the most widely studied in the world of Islam. That's how they pick these books, and this is one of those that is one of the hundred most important. So the shorter book on Muslim international. This is the summary book. Okay, let, let's have a look at some of the stuff that this shorter summary tells us. Chapter one, instructions of the Holy Prophet about the conduct of war. <laughs> That's a great start for the religion of peace right there. This Muslim is, this international is... law, chapter one, how to make war. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. You really couldn't. Prohibition of a warlike operation during the sacred months has, has... been abrogated. <laughs> so even when there was a glimmer of hope that there could be peace, even when if, the sacred if just... months have passed. The sacred month... Slay the unbeliever wherever, wherever you find them. Exactly. Well, this is this is how that is understood within the Sharia. Exactly. And then they say, okay, now you've made war. Now this is how you treat prisoners of war. That's when you become a dhimmi. You see, yeah. dhimmis are prisoners of war. What people do need to understand is as a dhimmi, you are literally a prisoner of war. Okay? So... That makes sense because I always, um, obviously, like, you know, the Quranic verses, which obviously focus on humiliate them you know Correct. get get them to pages yeah and get them to be subdued until you know they feel that they are oppressed kind of thing there's that's a very dark element to it like to the power struggle but then if you immediately put that into the context of islam being more of a political ideology and totalitarian in that sense you could see how dhimmis would immediately be the prisons of war in that sense yeah yeah Correct. Yeah, so so hopefully that clarifies. Hopefully that was useful to the audience and to yourself in learning. But Most understand definitely. that the, the priority of Islamic international law is making warfare to spread Islam, exactly as the Sharia dictates. So yeah. all of these sources are all in accord. There is no confusion amongst them. Right. Yeah. So I don't see how that means that you need to eat more salads and walk little old ladies across the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although, although there is hope, because today I saw a little, I saw an old lady get up and give her seat on the bus to a pregnant man. Oh wow! <laughs> what a time to be alive! <laughs> yeah, what a time to be alive. Um, so anyway, so um, yeah, moving on. Okay, so uh, this is, I think, the last slide that we had. So I'll just briefly okay. run through all of this. Uh, so Islam has two purposes, right? You know, two critical verses that define those two purposes. So this one, of course, Islam's religious purpose to claim that Jesus did not die on the cross, right? And thus it rejects and wants to correct Christian theology, right? The major foundation of Christian theology is that, is that Jesus died on the cross, that Jesus is the son of God, 
Jesus mm. died on the cross and he was resurrected, right? And without without those three things being present, then Christian theology would, would fail. Islam seeks to then undermine that by claiming the exact opposite. So when they say they're they are common Abrahamic faiths, that's not true. When they say that they are, we worship the same God, as we discussed, tell them, okay, fine. So say the Shahad in the name of Yahweh, that's never going to happen. Yeah, true. That will never happen. Right. Because it's not true. It's a lie. It's a complete mm. outright lie. Ask them, slaughter that. Okay, so the next time Eid comes around, slaughter your sheep in the name of Yahweh. That's not going to happen. Either. Not going to happen. <laughs> no. Okay. So, and then Quran 3104, Islam's political purpose is just to command the right and forbid the wrong. Or they'll say, like the Taliban calls it, uh, commanding commanding virtue and forbidding vice. Vice, yeah. Which, which we've shown you is basically an escalating ladder of violence, which includes use of arms, gang warfare, beating people up, and also legally breaking and entering their house. It's perfectly legal. And I've in the Afghanistani that. Taliban context, also controlling women, because that's how they wipe them out from society and yeah. turn. But yeah. we've, we've shown you the commanding the right. Actually, let me, since I'm here, let's just, um, so actually, let me go up here, the following. Uh, commanding the right. Mm. So commanding the right and forbidding the wrong, it's in the, it's in the Sharia, but let's go have a look here. Uh, and maybe I need to accelerate this by counting up, but I should That's have just okay. jumped to the page, but That's understand. Okay. Do you remember? Do you remember Mufti Abu Layth? Was it Mufti Abu Layth? Yeah. He, remember a whole like twenty people broke into his house when his wife and child were there. He yes. wasn't home. Yes. Right. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. Now I'm not going to go into this right now because this is not the, the the. But understand, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. We've shown this before, but it is legal in Islam if two witnesses state that that Muslim over there or that guy over there. He's done something wrong. Whatever, whatever that thing wrong. As long as two upright witnesses make a claim, yeah, you are legally allowed to break into his house and smash his furniture, which is exactly <sighs> what they did to Mufti Abu Leif. They broke into his house. They terrorized his wife while he wasn't home. Wow. Okay, this is insane because yeah, it it always amazes me that these there can be these certain acts that are carried out that we just say is, oh, okay, you know, that was them trying to act out and it could have, like, there's no real command behind that. That was their version of how things should have gone. And when they yeah. wanted to attack Mufti Abu Layth, that was what they thought was like, or whatever, that's the only chance they got. But no, that is you explicitly can make stated this in the link, Sharia. yeah, when you're able to literally link their actions so specifically to what is commanded deep within the books or the Sharia, that's what that's that's when it gets very very scary indeed yeah so yeah. Is, is that actually here so break it, yeah I, I would have to look for it. the thing is i wasn't okay. prepared to discuss it so i mean usually okay, I try we to could do it next time advance, no worries but um do with let me see if i can find that's it i'll fine, take a moment Don't worry. okay um oh oh by the way you know muslims will always say oh no the caliph the caliph has to give permission you know and if there's yes. no caliph well you know muslim some scholars say that they must have permission to do so from the caliph well notice down here Okay, this is untrue for the Quranic verses and hadiths indicate that whoever sees something wrong and does nothing has sinned. Oh Stipulating my. that there must be permission from the caliph is arbitrary opinion. Oh, wow. That is huge. Caliph. You don't you need You want to kill it. someone on the bridge? Go for it. Go in for fact, it, fact, if you saw something wrong and you didn't act, buddy, you're in trouble anyway because that's a sin. Yeah. So... Yeah. The, the caliph's, uh, his decision is literally redundant at that point. But wow, this is a very, very strong point here, Lloyd, because this is this is honestly what a lot of Muslims who I speak to latch on to and say, oh, even then, even in a perfect Islamic state, it still wouldn't be this way. Only a lesson until the, you know, the ruler gave his opinion on it. But no, not even required. Yeah. As a Muslim, you see not something required. wrong, you you're forced you to act. act on your own. Yeah. Yeah. You can act on your own, so you don't need permission from the caliph. One guy, there's this one fool that keeps trying to tell me this, and it's absolutely not true. I'm just trying to find the section on uh, where they tell you this. this they, they mention it twice where you can break into the house. Um, yeah. So you can break into the house. I'm just trying to find it if I can find it easily. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, no rush. Um. Okay. Okay. Here we go. This is one example of it here. Okay. Mm -hmm. If something is manifest to another outside the house, such as the sound of pipes and lutes, like a Muslim is playing music, someone yeah. who hears them may enter and break the instruments. In other <sighs> words, enter your house and smash 
your possessions. <laughs> if one smells the odor of wine outside the house, the sound opinion is that it is permissible to enter the house and condemn it. Wow. You may smash there. You may smash there. And there is no penalty, right? You can smash his furniture, smash his possessions, and there is no penalty. No, this is you permissibility may... through and through. It's actually like, you see this happen? By all means, go ahead. Smash. Into his house. Yeah. Break in, yeah. break an entry, trespass, smash his private property. Or hers. Like this is, and but Lloyd also just, um, this makes like it so understandable now where, where you see these like pockets of whether it's like Muslim immigrants or just heavily Islamicized societies, the level of mm. internal policing is so like um, out there and it's so apparent. So each, almost each neighbor is kind of policing each other. Do you know, mm. it's this very much like this holier than thou kind of atmosphere. It's policing almost other people's daughters. It's kind of internally judging who's wearing hijab, who's not, who's turning up for Friday prayer at the mosque, who's not. Do you know what I mean? It's it's mm. very much a case of like snitch on each other and go it's, like that. It's yeah, that that's, yeah. that's what I'm getting. You are constantly <laughs> under threat. So understand, this is the yeah. religion of legal breaking and entering. Yeah. So this is Islam. I mean, this is Islam. Okay. So now, as I said, this is commanding the right. That is commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. This is like Islam's great commission to command the right, and you can use force and violence to do so. Right. Yeah. As we showed, it allows it allows the use of weapons. You are even allowed to use weapons to do so. Right. So very briefly, statistics. Now, the statistics depend on where you get them. <laughs> I'll just say that bluntly. Yeah. Right. So the statistics are all over the place. But generally speaking, Hanafis are accepted to be the largest percentage, but they all much of a much. So I, I wouldn't make it. I would make nothing out of these differences. OK. Right. So, so this is really not that relevant. So I wouldn't worry about okay. it too much. But Hanafi Fiqh is the largest school, and so it's the most. But that said, blah blah blah. That that's not important. So mm. basic orthodoxy. We covered the Akida, right? Akida is like the creed in Islam, which we covered. And the Akida, obviously, as we've shown, is a primary science in Islam, and it teaches to hate. It says that okay. We say Allah knows best. That is actually in the creed, and we must hate non-Muslims. So the people of injustice and treachery. That's you, right? They are taught to hate, right? This is within the Islamic creed. This is orthodoxy across all the sects of Islam. Right, so we covered that. And now, <clears throat> so Islam's religion of law. So there are two basic questions we need to answer. What are its laws? Where are those laws found? Those laws are found in books. Those books are readily available. Um, I don't know if you've dropped the link in the chat, but if you can, you know, everyone can go to my archive. You can download yeah. dozens of these Sharia manuals. No one Sharia manual covers everything. So you have to go to multiple manuals. There'll be specialists in marriage, specialists in divorce. So you'll go to a book that specializes in that, and they'll have more detail than another book that's more general. There'll be specialists in property, in, in commerce, and in slavery. And so you'll find different manuals on different things that are authoritative. Every school will have a manual, but one scholar somewhere has become the major authority in his book in that school has become the one that they all go to and then and vice versa they so the schools don't matter they all cross reference to each other right uh this we've covered before so i'm not going to spend too much time but in pakistan this this was put together by two professors of law in pakistan right in lahore and they said that the hadaya is the most used so the following books are found to be relied upon more frequently by the court system in pakistan to derive an authentic point of islamic law so even Pakistani secular courts yeah. utilize Sharia law manuals, the Hedaya being the most common, and then the digest of Muhammadan law. We've just covered the Hedaya. I've yeah. just shown you guys the Hedaya, right? The next one is the digest of Muhammadan law, and this is from a PhD professor of law. Now, sadly, all the YouTube commenters are more highly ranked than every single PhD professor. Did you know that? No, I actually did not. All the Abduls in the comments... Are, are, are more highly ranked than every single Islamic scholar that ever lived. That's I discovered yeah. that recently. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm not surprised, but like, yeah, that's a very sad state of affairs, obviously. But yeah. I mean, that's what happens when it's almost become like minions. Yeah. Yeah, no. So, yeah, I mean, they just deny everything. It's like X Files, just deny everything. Now, look, yeah. I've covered this before and I'm not looking to gross anybody out, but notice. When a man has sex with a girl under the age of nine years and he has ruptured her vagina, he shouldn't have further sex with her. But if she's connected with him by marriage or slavery, 
she still remains with him. So remember, this is under nine. Under nine could mean six months old. Yeah. Right. And and if he has a slave, well, hey, <laughs> there you go. But if she doesn't rupture, then go for it. Understand? We've covered this before. I don't want to go there again. Yeah. We've covered this in detail. This means that the waiting period is obligatory for women divorced after intercourse, whether or not the husband and wife are prepubescent or pubescent. So we know this. We've covered this before. Yeah. Right? This is pretty gross, but understand mm. Islam, Very. you can look at previous shows. We've discussed this in detail. Islam permits prepubescent sex. Yeah. It is perfectly legal in Islamic law. Feel free to cite me the Islamic law that says otherwise. I'd be happy to see it if you can show me. Bring me the book, not your opinion. But it is perfectly legal to diddle, literally, and I'm, I am not kidding when I say this, infants in the cradle are legal. Okay, I am going to skip over a lot of this because here they speak of underage, minor girl, with a minor girl. A minor means she's not even nine years old. Okay, yeah. and they speak here of, oh, I'm going to show something as well. If a person whose testicles have been cut off inserts his penis into the back part of anyone, it'll be fad. Okay, we've yeah. covered this before, and I don't know if I've showed you. Have I showed that little that picture about the, um, have I done that? Not to my knowledge. Um, so, yeah. so okay. Uh, have I discussed Islamic homosexuality? I think we did touch on it very briefly. Yes, we did. I'm going to touch on it very briefly again, and I'm just going to okay, annoy sure. people. This sure. is just to annoy certain people. This is called okay. Islamic homosexualities, and a oh, cute little picture. Oh, boy. And I'm just going to show one little photo. So, please, if there's kids in the room, send them out of the room. Close your eyes if you're squeamish. Okay? Uh, I just I just don't want to, I don't want to get into a long story here, but... but uh, Let's have a look here. Okay. Now, remember, Muslims always say that's not Islamic. That's cultural. Mm. The problem is Islamic law recognizes culture as Islamic. There is a maxim that says that cultural practice has the weight of law. So if it is in the culture, it is legal. Right. right? Bachabazi. Bachabazi is legal. Yeah. They'll say, but Muhammad didn't allow men to diddle men. Well, actually, maybe not so fast. Because let's have a look at this. You'll see these guys here. Um, I, you can figure out for yourself what they're doing. Oh, boy, mm. look at that. Isn't that just great? And um, if you can just read this sentence for me here, Nuria. Lining up to use a boy from a Sawakib al Manakib library, the Topkabi Palace Museum. Muslims lining, lining up, up to use a boy. Not a girl, a boy. That's a boy. So you guys make of that what you will. I just reported I didn't make it up. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Okay. And a man should not accuse his wife of adultery, especially when it's impossible, such as when his wife is an infant. So, yeah. So because she didn't go out and seek it. You see, the other guy seduced the wife. The wife yeah. was nine months old, seven Rocking months old. Rocking in a cradle. Yeah, so so this is Islam, and yeah, and that's and I, prepubescent at the time of marital intercourse, you see, and of course you can be stoned to death otherwise. You see, if you're not married, well, you can be stoned to death. She's stoned to death, so that yeah. that's legal. Okay, so yeah, and just to touch on what you're pointing, saying, Lord, as well, even Muhammad Hijab has come out openly and said that the Quran has no minimum age for who you can marry. So even Muslims yep. who think that that's like your saving grace, it really isn't. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's, that's how that works. Right. Um, yeah. So anywho, moving on now. So back to, back to the regularly scheduled programming. Yes. <laughs> right. So Islam is rules and regulations. So the word shari has the plural shawari, which means clearly defined way. It also has aspects of being a main road, a highway. So that's literal meanings, right? Situated in the main road at the side of the road, right? It used to mean main arterial road. However, in our context, it means the lawgiver. Characteristically, Muhammad in his function as model and exemplar of the law. Within Islam, within the Sharia, Muhammad is the lawgiver and he is synonymous. He has exactly the same authority as Allah. Yeah. In the Sharia, Muhammad and Allah are interchangeable. They are both the lawgiver. I mean, you must understand, this is shirk. This is all over Islam, right? Mm -hmm. And the Sharia, okay, plural, Sharai, 
is a prophetic religion in its totality within Muslim discourse, the rules and regulations. Now, this is politics and law. Yeah. It's not religion governing the lives of Muslims. It is Islamic jurisprudence, right? Now, of course, in the Quran, it means a way or path divinely appointed, but it is a legal system. It's a method, a legal method, a system like communism is a system. That's all it means. So I just want to say here, I just want to just want to hone this point home that the fact that when people say like, oh, Hinduism is a way of life or spirituality is a way of life or Islam is a way of life. Sure, you can apply those same standards to Islam. But then, as Lloyd just said, you've also got to, to know that that in that way of life, that includes a total legal system already ready made for you to follow down to the last t so it's almost a a totalitarian political legal requirement as well for you to be a part of this way of life it's not just a way of life that you can tap in and tap out to you are held accountable to those laws correct so um you know there are a couple of comments that that um I mean, really, honestly, guys, there's some really ignorant comments in the comments. So, um, yeah, sorry. I'm not going to comment okay. on that, but, but really, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I just don't want us to get. You know, um, everyone has an today. opinion. Everyone yeah. has an opinion. But uh, it's just it just amazes me how, yeah. Okay, so now Islamic law deals with two broad aspects of regulation. Now, there's other kinds of law. For instance, there's a kind of law called kanun, which is called canon which is actually, which is really, and I'm not going to be discussing that, but I'll just mention it because I think I do briefly touch on it, uh, but I won't be going in. Basically, this is where Islam recognizes cultural law and that cultural law is then absorbed into Sharia as legal, like like diddling little boys in Pakistan. That's right. kanun. It comes yes. from the word canon. Yes. Right? So so this is this is cultural law, cultural practice. When say, no, it's not Islam, it's culture. Well, that culture is Islam. It is Islamic. It's accepted into the law. Right. So there are laws dealing with your duty to Allah called the Ibadat, which are the five pillars of Islam, for instance, the profession of the faith, the prayer, fasting, almsgiving and pilgrimage. It should be noted that almsgiving, the zakat, is new prior to almsgiving replacing, well, almsgiving replaced jihad. Oh, okay. Almsgiving replaced some of the earlier notice from what I've read in some of the earlier references. um, There wasn't almsgiving, there was jihad as one of the five pillars. Because that also becomes one of the loopholes to fasting as well. Like if you can't, and yeah, again, eventually we can't want it. But I didn't realize it, it replaced child altogether so you could actually stay home. Yeah, there's all these weird-ass rules, right? And then so <laughs> okay. now, now these laws are generally dealt with first in all the fifth books. These are the books of law, right? Yeah. And we'll cover it. So. And then laws governing human relations are called mu'amalat or transactions. In other words, it's like a business transaction. You see, when you sell your soul to Allah, right, when you say the Shahada, it is literally, see, the Shahada uh, is like Baya. I think it's called Baya, not Bayan, Baya. I need to double check. I'll get to it. But basically, it's a transaction. It's a sale. You are selling something. It's a commercial transaction. And within the context of the West, we view that when someone does a commercial action on a religious basis, you are selling your soul to the devil. That's the only Western context we have. See, yeah, so technically yeah. in Islam, you are literally selling your soul. You are making a commercial transaction, right? Oof, yeah, no wonder it so, feels. <laughs> so terrible. marriage and divorce are commercial are are transactions. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense because even the word nikah in Arabic comes from the nkh derivative, which literally means like sex or sexual intercourse. Yeah. So the well, entire thing is a contract for sexual intercourse. And it's so sad that a lot of people in the community put such a heavy emphasis on something like this. But in reality, this is a contract made between your husband and your father for him to be able to have sex with you. And there's a certain price that's given um, in return for that. That's all it is. It's not some sacred, beautiful union or or marriage yeah. before God. It really is not. Well, well let's, let's have a quick look at that. Since, since we brought it up, let's have a quick look. I guess this is... Uh, sure. So, for instance, these are the rules of marriage. I'll just, just briefly... Okay, so this is the index on the section on marriage. Okay, this mm-hmm. is the index on the section on just marriage. Yeah. Okay, who should marry, who should not, when a woman should marry, desirable characteristics, sooners of engagement. Let's continue. This is just page one, the integrals of marriage. Shaking hands with the opposite sex is unlawful, permissible looking at the opposite sex. Looking at your spouse's genitals is offensive. 
<laughs> women may not show herself to non-Muslim women, stipulating condi conditions such as monogamy. That's page one, okay? Then page two, these are all the laws wow. and the rules. So everything you ever wanted to know about this nonsense. The wife's marital obligations, she must let, let her husband, her husband have, sex. have sex. There's a whole little paragraph dedicated to that. Cannot That's her obligation. No. Cannot say no. to say no. No agency. <laughs> The wife's right to intercourse, the wedding night, the husband's rights, blah, 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 page two, and then we go on, there's page three. Permitting your wife to leave the house, she may go anywhere in town, traveling by herself is unlawful, taking turns with wives. Taking turns with wives, there's a chapter on that. Oh, oh yeah. Islam. Yeah. That was wonderful. So that's page three, wonderful. you go on page three, oh my, oh my, oh my, three pages just on the index. It's like 100 pages or something, like 80 pages of, of this <laughs> It now, the thing wisdom. is, when I ask Muslims, they say the Quran is everything we need. I say, okay, show me the five daily prayers in the Quran. They can't because yeah. it's not there. I exactly. say, show me the Shahada, the full Shahada that you say. You know the Shahada that you guys all say? So we oh. only follow the Quran. Oh, so show me the Shahada in the Quran. Can't find it there, can you? It's not there either. Right? No. So you don't follow show the Quran. Show me how you do the Hajj. Show me how you do a lot, a lot yeah, of yeah. things aren't there. Yeah. Show me how you do a marriage. All these marriage yeah. laws. Show me, show me those in the Quran. Show me how you do the prayer in the mosque. Exactly. It's not in the Quran either, buddy. You don't yeah. follow the Quran. You follow this stuff. You want to learn how? It's in here, right? Mm -hmm. But let's have a quick look here. Now, let's have, no, you see, marriage is not about the woman. Let's see what marriage is about. A man who needs to marry because of desire for sexual intercourse and he has enough money of is course. recommended to do so. <laughs> of course. Marriage is all about the male satisfaction of their desire for sexual Correct. intercourse. Correct. So basically, let's retranslate this into 21st century English. Yes. You're horny. You have some money. <laughs> Get yourself a woman. Yeah, exactly. Which is, I'm sorry, that is literally the checklist of a lot of young men in Muslim majority countries. That is it. They are frustrated beyond a point because the opposite sex has become so taboo. They've been so segregated. They don't have normal interactions with the opposite sex. Their entire worldview of relationships and sex is porn. And some of the most horrible categories of porn that you could ever imagine come out of countries mm. like Pakistan. Um, and then, yeah, th these, but the next thing is that they, after they get the basic requirements of education, they're planned to be married off. They don't care mm. about anything as far as compatibility or, you know, it's a more, a, a, the more yeah. educated a woman is, the more of a threat she is to these people. So yeah, it's not surprising to me that this is why Islam destined marriage. Yeah. Can someone put Bob Marley in timeout? Because I'm not sure what what show he's watching, but I don't think his comments oh. are related to. Uh, it's just that's just just you know. Yeah, sure. About. Let me see if I can sort it out. Carry on. Just just Lloyd, getting sorry on about topic. That. Or, you know. Yeah. Okay. So that aside, you know. <clears throat> okay. So now, then you've got laws. These these are transactions, but technically they will fall under the 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 the, the umbrella of commercial transactions. They're regarded as transactions of sale, right? Yeah. And now ibadat means submissive obedience to a master. It's not worship. Duty to Allah is submissive obedience. Do mm -hmm. what you're told, and therefore it is religious practice. So religious practice in Islam is submissive obedience to a slave master, right? And this corresponds to the ritual of Muslim law and acts which bring the creature into contact with his creator. So in other words, it's you do these things and you'll be fine, right? That's how that works, okay? And its counterpart, mu'ammalat, signifies relations between individuals, which is the transactions between individuals. I do something for you, you do something for me. Yeah. Right. Now, submissive means allowing yourself willing to be controlled inclined or ready to submit, to yield to the authority of another, unresistingly obedient. These are not positive connotations. Not at all. Not at all. Right. So now let's have a look at deen. So I'll run through this. We've covered this before, but Islam is a deen. It is not a religion. It doesn't even call itself a religion. Religion within Islam is entirely optional. It's an optional concept. It is not a primary concept. Let's have a quick run through of this. Deen is a socio-political system. It is not a religion. So it has perspectives on existence, on life and society, and, and it is a socio-political system. It's a complete and competing ideology with Western democracy. It competes with Western law. It competes sure. with Western civilization. It, it yeah. wants to impose itself, just like communism does, like Nazism did, and so on, on society and replace Western ideas, right? So it believes it is a political framework for managing mankind's affairs, and it must take over the world by warfare, as we've discovered. 
earlier. So in the linguistic meaning, now there are two very famous Islamic dictionaries. The one is called the al qamus al-Muhit, and the more famous one is called the Lisan al-Arab, 20 volumes. And in both of these, they show that there are four meanings of the word deen. Subjugation and dominance, which includes ownership, government, administrative, or legislative authority. This is politics. Yeah. This is not religion. Ownership no, through and, and through, that's politics. Yeah. Subjugation and dominance. To yes. subjugate through force. Dominance. Right? Then obedience, bondage, subordination, and dominance under the power of, well, others being Muslims. Yeah, exactly. The third meaning, rules and regulations. This is law, doctrine, mm. ideology, tradition. Notice all oh. religion, not and all. Or and religion. and Lloyd, just the very thing that Islam <laughs> can claims to be is showing up in the third definition as yeah. as a possibility as yeah, an interchangeability as an exactly as an option. Yeah. yeah yeah and then finally you have reward and repayment which includes justice and accountability so justice is kind of low down the list here very low down the list yeah right? for religion of peace so, and so let's yeah sorry uh, do, do you want to say something sorry no, no, go ahead go ahead carry on yeah. So the first meaning is of a deen, the first meaning of deen, because remember, Islam is a deen, it calls itself a deen. They keep, everyone has these names, like you'll see, uh, let me just do this. You'll always see the guy's name is, um, for instance, you'll see this name. This is a very popular one, Saif al-Din, okay, or Saif al-Din. You'll see deen or deen, right? Yeah. This means the sword of the deen. Yes, it does. Yeah, you're right. right? So this, this is not just a random name. This guy was raised as the sword of the deen, the sword of the religion. Yeah. The religion of peace. That's why he's okay. Anywho. Yeah. <clears throat> I know some some safe of uh, uh, Allah's. So safe of like sword of gods. Yeah. <laughs> well. it, it, that's it was also part of the Islamic emblem. Like if you look at the Saudi flag and things like that, they're not just in there symbolically and, also, and reductively. Like they actually have there's a meaning behind it. Bro, exactly. Swords. Safe Allah, the sword of yeah, swords of God. Sword. Yeah. Actually, yeah, you know what? The, the, so when you look at the Freemasons, I, 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 I promised we we said we would do the uh, the occult in Islam, but when yeah. you look at the Freemasons, they have Islamic symbolism throughout, and the, the same cross swords on the on the Islamic flag on the black yeah. flag of Muhammad, that symbolism is rife within Masonic symbolism as well. It's very Islamic, and it's but I'll cover that one day. I'll actually go through. We'll, we'll do that one day. Yeah, so to finish this, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first meaning is subjugation or dominance, administrative or legislative authority to put pressure to be obedient, using power to enslave or to make people obedient. Power to enslave. In Arabic, tentuhum fadanu means I subjugated them so they obeyed me. So you used force, in other words. Yeah. It means I ruled or governed upon him. This is now obviously politics. The word dayan is used to indicate a person who dominates and rules over a state. This is politics. Yeah. Right? So nation or tribe. So you must start at the tribal level, then a national level, then eventually take over the world. The second meaning is obedience and bondage, subordination and domination by someone, and bearing humiliation under subjugation and power of the Muslims. The obedient tribe is called Kalmun Da'inun, and here Adin does not mean religion, it means obedience. <laughs> wow. You know what? I'm sorry, but this this has to give you a moment of pause because the way Dean, as I said, as Lloyd and I discussed earlier, like the fact that it's it could be a religion, one of many possibilities, the fact mm -hmm. that here it's outwardly expressing that there is some level of people who have been humiliated, subjugated, oppressed, oppressed, dominated over, and the word deen can still apply to them because in this instance it correlates to sheer and utter obedience to Islam or to the Muslim rule. Yes. And I mean, this just, I mean, Lloyd, it screams at me, this is like a political ideology that's hell-bent on expansionism right yeah. at the cost of suppressing minorities and this is a problem we see today in every country that has islamic elements to it minorities suffer because they do genuinely expect everybody else to be obedient yeah yeah you know what surprises me is uh, excuse my french i know this is your audience but there's some really dumb comments in the comments <laughs> sorry about yeah. that. it's just just really um yeah okay right now understand if you put these in a list everyone says well islam's a religion See, you are yeah. here. And remember, this is an optional word. So we're ignoring ownership of everything, government, 
government's a very big topic. True. Administrative and legislative authority. Running the country, passing laws, subordinating people, dominating them, doctrine, ideology, tradition. Tradition oh, comes before religion. Measly religion there at 10, just raking yeah. in after tradition. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so Lloyd, sorry, is that is that why it's a bit uh, of a telltale thing that tradition can, because as you said, like, for example, Kanun, uh, that comes from canon can it like if, if it's there and it's a tr tradition and it's embedded in society and culture islam yep. kind of just latches on superimposes and takes it on so the word in urdu actually for law is kanun so if you talk about things like let's say bachabazi or if you talk about parts of africa that were already in common, engaging yeah. in fgm for example um are these so is is this why maybe islam would be okay to like embed them and then make them part and parcel of Islamic culture within those areas. Yeah, they they were trying to just be everything to everyone. They didn't want to okay. upset anyone. They were they were trying to absorb. Remember, they were they were on conquest, right? They were, right. They were making conquest. They wanted to absorb everybody into their empire. So they had to say, "Well, uh, you know what? We do that too. Come on in. Come on in. Come okay. on. In. We got a home for you." Yeah. Now, that's notice, what I was okay. now this is Wikipedia. Fine and well, but Wikipedia makes look. I mean, man, Wikipedia cannot be trusted. That said. Some articles are good. I mean, there's some material in Wikipedia that's accurate and that is good. Now, yeah. of course, this article does kind of lie because they speak of the five normative maxims of Islamic law. Technically, there are 99 of these maxims, but, but yeah, fine and well. Okay. I'd rather just look at the five, okay? So let's, yes. I mean, you can see here, notice, cultural usage shall have the weight of law. If it is in the culture, it is legal. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what you said earlier. It's true. Yes. Cultural usage shall have the weight of the law. Okay. D just on a personal level, though, this explains so much to me because I was like, what? Like, there are some times when people say, oh, you know, when you're trying to give the argument that that is Islam. And they say, no, that's not Islam. That's culture. But you're like, no, but there's Islamic culture. Do you not understand that that could be a thing? But then they try and separate it. The lines get very blurred. But this makes so much sense now, Lloyd, because they have yeah. almost given it the permissibility to just in, to, to almost diffuse into the same thing and become that for that very region. Yeah. You know what amazes me? Sorry, just 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 off topic. My my apologies. Yes, I get I get distracted by the comments. That's Look, okay. If if I had to like this guy irreligious making his comments, I won't I won't discuss the quality of the comments, but it's yeah. good. So so the thing is, if people had to discuss Islam, they're going to say, well, you know, the Quran says, and then the Hadith say, I'm an expert on Islam because the Quran and the Hadith. No, 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 you're not. You're not. You're absolutely positively at the bottom level of knowledge, the absolute bottom of the barrel, the lowest you can get. You're in kindergarten Islam, right? And when people, and they say, well, you know, and then of course, because they've accepted this whole mythology about Islam as, but this is not, this is Islam, what I'm showing, the detail, this is the scholarly level, this is what the PhDs are taught in university, right? Whereas now, now they take other knowledge they also have, and they're like, well, you know, that the Freemasons and the blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, maybe if you're as dumb about Islam as you are, then maybe you're not very smart about anything else either. Maybe there's more to that than you realize, than you're aware of. Maybe you haven't looked very far. Maybe you've just listened to some other propagandist who filled your head with nonsense, just like your head was filled with nonsense about Islam. Think beyond the box. You know, people say, actually, no, but hold on. Then again, people say, think outside the box. You know what? Most of you cannot think inside the box to begin with. I'll leave my rent there. My apologies. I don't mean to, <laughs> okay. This is not directed at all of your audience. There's a couple of people that are just saying dumb things. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. So anyway, so culture. So sorry, you were saying my apologies. I interrupted you. But yeah, so this yeah, no, it, it just amazes me. Yeah, it, it makes sense now how obviously you've got the various schools of thoughts, as you said, the different Akidas as well. But like, how is Islam sort of being pluralistic to all of these various different ideas, taking bits of it and they are all... They all exist within various schools of thought, but each one will just say, oh, no, that's a, their cultural problem. It's not an Islamic one, but that's still being it's practiced Islamic. in the name of Islam. Exactly. So yeah, it's completely yeah. Islamic. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Um, anyway, moving on. So now we need to understand that there is a Hebrew slash Jewish origin to much of what is Islamic law. It is not the only origin, but I'm generally going to be focusing because we've done the section on the pagan origins. We, we've covered mm -hmm. the whole pagan origins, how Islam 
robbed paganism of its of its stuff and jammed it into this. Well, Islam is originally pagan, but yeah. they had to cover themselves with what looked like a modern religion, with something you know that they had to look not pagan. So they've yes. they've taken so they've taken um, shall we say Jewish law, right, the Talmud, and they've they've tried to camouflage themselves with the Talmud. That said, the the Sharia and the Talmud, while technically the Sharia is the Talmud of Islam, it is a very cheap copy. It's a very different mm. thing. It's a very different animal. But that said, the word Deen means law in Hebrew. Okay, right? wow, yeah. So the word Deen also means law in Hebrew. Yeah. And Islam calls itself the Deen al-Haq, meaning the truth or the right, the religion yeah. of truth or the, the law of the truth, right? The Conversely, Christianity and Judaism and all other religions by default then become the Deen al batal which means the false religions, the void religions, technically the religions of Satan, because Batal is one of the names of Satan. Oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now, yeah. so Deen is the same word as the Jewish Haq, the stat statutes. Oh, Notice right. the Deen ul Haq, mm -hmm. the law and the statutes. See, they've borrowed these words. So, so basically they've plagiarized the Talmud. Mm. However, I can I can tell you they've inverted the Talmud. They've they've completely man the two are completely different. Yeah. And yes, I know the Talmud better than you do. I do. I really do. Much better. Sorry. And sorry, you, like, correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, I know. I get you're talking to the audience, but also I I've just been re like watching a couple of podcasts recently. Is it true the Talmud is almost written in a form that's more kind of commentaries on commentaries and building? It's off an of that? argument. It's a debate. Right. It's a yes. series of questions. It's a series of legal yes. problems that are that are designed to challenge your knowledge. So they'll say theft is legal. Yeah. And then someone will go, well, it's legal because of this. And then another, no, 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 no. It can't be because they're playing devil's advocate. Yeah, that's the, the thing. It's literally like philosophical Socratic set, like a, a conversation yeah. happening. Whereas right. what you see in the Islamic context is, is These remarkably are different. These yeah, are yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, so so you will they will have debates. So so the 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 Talmud is a series of debates on legal points to try to find every aspect, every permutation. So when people say, Well, you know, I Remember, we covered one lot. You know what? Maybe we can do another one today just on covering uh, the Talmud. So actually, um, uh, maybe, okay. Uh, we covered, remember we covered law one last week where we discussed where, 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 um, where Owen Benjamin says in Talmud, it says you can lie. Remember? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so let me do the following. Okay. So for instance, I'm going to go into the Talmud. So, so um, just um, as part of this offhand discussion, for instance, people love to say that the Talmud says that, that Christians and non, non Jews are, well, they have sex with animals, mm. right? They, that they, they, right. They pack practice bestiality. Let's have a look at so people love to throw out these very vague accusations. Now, the problem is that I am copying this out of a very small, this is a very small excerpt from a very long, several pages of discussion. Gotcha. Maybe a whole chapter of, could be 20 pages of discussion, could be 50 paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And then someone rips out two, three, four, five words like they did last week when I showed, last time I showed. Now, in the Mishnah, they say, well, one, so here's the claim. Avodah Zara 22a says, Christians have intercourse with animals. Okay, fine and well. Let's let's have a look at that because people love to make these claims. So one may not keep an animal in the inns of Gentiles because they are suspected of bestiality. Now, this is not a claim. This is a legal argument that's put forward as a devil's advocate sort of thing. Well, guys, mm. discuss. Okay. Right. Yeah. Since even Gentiles are prohibited from engaging in bestiality, a Jew who places his animal there is guilty of violating the prohibition. You shall not put a stumbling block before the blind. That's in Leviticus 19.14. And a woman may not seclude herself with Gentiles because they are suspected of engaging in forbidden sexual relations. Any person may not seclude himself with Gentiles because they are suspected of bloodshed. Okay, that's 22a. So let's go to 22b. And the Gemara then says, you see, so what happens is you will have claim, counterclaim. Mm -hmm. Claim, Contra counterclaim. Yes, yes, yes. Claim, yes. refutation, right? So the Gemara raises a contradiction. You see, so this is claim, counterclaim, claim, counterclaim, argument, counter argument, argument, counter. They are testing the law. Yes. Right? They're testing the law. That's all they do. So with regard to the assumption that Gentiles are suspected of bestiality, the Gemara raises a contradiction. 
one may purchase an animal from Gentiles for use as an offering, and there is no concern that it might be unfit to it, unfit due to it being an animal that copulated with a person or due to it being an animal that was the object of bestiality. A Gentile, okay, protects and thereby spares his own animal so that it will not become barren, since an act of bestiality may cause an animal to become barren. Therefore, there is no concern that the Gentile engaged in immoral behavior with it. Do you understand? And this is the conclusion of yeah. this one. Yeah. So this is not a claim. This is a question. This is a legal problem. And there's a discussion this, that's followed by a counterclaim. And then again, And yeah, then this claim, is the law that yeah. is now, here's the law. Exactly. Now, very often, there is no end. The discussion just ends abruptly. So very yeah. often it just ends abruptly. There is no conclusion, right? But it's it's like a test. It's like giving the students a technical problem and saying, okay, guys, here's the problem. How yeah, do you deal yeah. with this? Here's a legal problem. And that's all it is. Yeah, or like the start of an essay, you give a proposition, say discuss, and you just, yeah, you see where that goes. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully, so I mean, there's there'll be claims like, oh, no, the Jews say you can steal people's stuff. Man, I can go into that as well. No, <laughs> absolutely not. No. I mean, so yeah, what? So yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just, yeah, um, it just shocks me. So moving on. Okay, now, okay, so now Islam has two divisions and has four levels. The two divisions are begin with the Sharia, okay, which is the law of Islam, the law that you follow, the rules, the regulations, the rules that you follow. This is the legislative side of Islam. Now, the Sharia is about obeying the law, right? Do this, follow these rules, you won't get hurt. It is called the Zahid, the outer, the exoteric side of Islam, the outer expression of Islam, right? It's not an internal thing. It's simply just follow these rules, do this stuff, make sure people see you do this stuff, right? Mm. <laughs> it is yeah. outer meaning, outer practice, and it's the first and the plain level of meaning, right? Now, the higher level of knowledge is reserved for the major imams, the higher qualified imams, right? Not even yeah. average imams. Even if you run a mosque, that doesn't mean you really know this stuff. <clears throat> So, hakika is the knowledge, the spiritual. Technically, it is the gnosis. Because right. Islam within the Sharia, as we said, explicitly claims to be Gnostic. Yeah. It is a Gnostic religion, right? So, hakika means to know Allah because the Quran doesn't really have Allah as a person, as a, as a character. So, this is about getting to know Allah, getting in touch. In fact, in, in effect, it is communion with Allah. This is the batin, the inner, the esoteric, the hidden aspect of Islam. It is inner, it is direct, it is personal knowledge. It is an experience of the gnosis of Allah. But again, yeah. this side of it that you've just mentioned, Lloyd, again, like, okay, the legislative side is one thing, but the spiritual side is all I can think of is just Sufi Islam and Sufism. And yes. again, when it comes to Hakika and knowing Allah, and you, you talked about communion, communion with Allah, that is yes. exactly the, that is, to a Sufi, what nirvana is to a Buddhist mm -hmm. or something like that is literally, they call it the union with the beloved. Um, yeah. Now, I will mention, look, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail and it would yeah. take me too long to try to find it because it's a couple, two or three years since I read this. I've been meaning to get into it, but it, it hasn't been a priority for me. But if you go into the Sufi understanding of Allah, Allah is a duality. On the outer core, Allah is masculine. But the right. inner core, the essence of Allah is female. Okay. Allah is a woman. It might okay. seem weird. I mean, don't, don't ask no, me to because that's yourself. what don't I first realized you... when I was delving into Sufism and they kept talking about a marriage, a marriage with God, a union with Allah. And I kept thinking from coming from my non-Sufi-esque mindset was that is very shirk in its nature to say. But sure, um, because all I've taught is you can't attribute partners to Allah. Allah does not have a wife. Allah does not at the very have a feminine form at all right but here okay well, well let's let's talk yeah. about that just a moment look this is now just me throwing something out in islam yeah. men wear white women wear black yes okay women have sort of gold braid on the sleeves they have gold braid you know i mean in, not, not maybe in this particular example but you but can get embroidered abayas yes in the women's abayas you'll have gold mm -hmm. braid and things you know you'll see yeah. that so mm -hmm. understand so let's go have a look at this thing called the kaaba neck have a quick quick oh, I look see at what that. you're doing Lloyd I see what oh, you're doing did you see what I just oh did? I got a hunch you see yes. now now notice <laughs> hold on let's have a look here now Damn. why is the Kaaba wearing a burqa it's dressed in black <laughs> it's true it's a why very it's... nice burqa for the Kaaba 
Yeah. You understand. Why is it in black? If Allah is yeah. a man, why is that in black? And Lloyd, oh my God, the funniest thing just came to my mind. You hold your thought as well, because I want to hear the rest of this. But for example, in Saudi Arabia, as a young girl, I had to wear an abaya from, you know, being even before I was a teenager, I had to wear an abaya. It's just the done thing. You have the Islamic mm -hmm. police, the Mudawa. They don't like you walking around malls unless you're covered up, even as a young girl. And lo and behold, if, if you walk fast and a bit of your ankle shows, that could be enough to tempt men who obviously have no connection with the opposite sex or self-control because of that. And it's funny that Allah himself says, you on the day of, what is it, on the day of judgment or something, they will see Allah will reveal his shin, which is yeah. the, exact, the exact same part of the body that's revealed when the abaya is slightly, you know, and you walk too uh -huh. fast or whatever. It's just interesting, yeah. yeah. So just to but, ask a few questions. Now, technically, this is the night sky and this is the Milky Way and the galaxies, the stars at night, because Islam also happens to have pagan star worship roots, okay? Yeah. I mean, in fact, hold on, let me, since, since we are on this little rant here. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully, I mean, all, all these little connections are making sense, I assume, right? Hopefully they, they are useful. Yes, no, um, most definitely. I like these tangents we take. Right. <laughs> Um, so within Islam, so remember, so you, based on their pagan origins, which is supposedly the Milky Way and the stars, because you've got the, you know, you've got the moon and the stars yeah. right next to the Kaaba, you've got the crescent of the moon. And it's like the, the earthly projection of what's happening are so above, so below, so above, right? That kind of, yeah, which uh, is not, yeah, like, yes, above, so exactly. Below, right? Yes. Um, you know, so yeah. You know, I should have looked up the word soul, I think. Okay, I need to just start again, but the word soul. Because in Islam, they believe the following. It searches as fast as it searches, even on the most powerful machine. That's okay, don't worry. We really appreciate you delving into these random little tidbits that are just... So, the incarnation of souls... But yeah, Lloyd, really this, this, because on one side there on the slide, you had the very strict Sharia, and then we've got the very esoteric what? Sufi Islam. And I think that is the best way to, to, to look at Islam holistically. It's very totalitarian. And then they have this weird initiation, Gnostic, Freemasonry type, you know, secret society thing to it as well. Yeah. No. So briefly, in, so in Islamic, so, in, so this is we won't get into this much, but notice yeah. in Islam. So in is, in Islam in astrology, atar is also used as a technical term in the theory of causality with with reference to the influence of the stars. So in Islam, the stars are considered as higher beings possessing a soul. Oh wow! So, yes. <laughs> yeah. So in Islam, the stars yeah. have souls. The stars right. are alive. Right. But, so there's also that. Okay. So back to back to the. Um, okay. Someone mentioned earlier about the. Um, Someone mentioned about the, um, yeah, I'll have to think of dirty Dean, Dean, Dean in Europe, UK. Yeah, you know, I'd have to yeah, think about that Norse mythology. I'll definitely, North let me mythology. ponder that. Yeah. Um, but people's men, someone mentioned the Shriners. Now, don't forget, not every Freemason is a Shriner, but every Shriner is a Freemason, right? And the, and the Shriners are explicitly Islamic. And that influence, you'll see that there's a very strong, um, Islamic influence, even in the even in the Freemasons, the, it's, the symbolism is there. It's subtle, but it's there. It's very clearly there. Okay, moving on from this. Yeah. Right. Sorry, uh, no, just one, that. just yeah. one second. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in there and say, because uh, Norse mythology is a regular follower. So yeah, no, thank you so much. And is this the Dean Dean like Din Dean in Europe thing that? Obviously, because even in the UK, for example, if this is a reference to more of the political aspect of things Lord, like we're using so. the subjugation right the heavy subjugation you, you do see examples of it like i mean you, look you, I, I see the same behaviors which are stipulating the sharia and you see it in like the way some politicians behave the things that they okay. do like um then i just can't think of examples offhand but you do see it like yeah. in cancel culture that 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 is like clearly it, you know it's islamic it's at least it follows that template you know, there's there's so many things that are happening that, but I mean, the push for pedophilia. You see, like and when TEDx even had this this talk on trying to legalize pedophilia as a as a normal sexual orientation. I mean, 
that yeah. Islam supports that 100% and stuff like that. So I'll ponder that. There are examples that has occurred to me. People have mentioned it to me, but I, I can't think of it offhand. And like so, the incident with, I just thought, like the incident with identity true. politics and grooming gangs in the UK, for example. Again, it's just something that is 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 very Islamic in nature. And if you really understand the deen or the religion, that is something that you're going to want to try and propagate. But also this entire, I'm talking strictly from a UK context, but like the entire Salman Rushdie affair from the very inception when it happened, I feel like yeah. was a manifestation of that because that he, that was explicitly um, yeah. Islamic. Yeah, because yeah. I've shown that before. I mean, we've shown this before, but for instance, this is the unsheathed sword against the one who insults the messenger, right? And I'll very be brief. Uh, hopefully I'm not being rep repetitive, but the content of this book concerned the Islamic ruling upon those who insult Muhammad. And I'll just do the, the, intro, the intro chapter and it states right here, um, whoever insults the prophet is to be killed. This is chapter one, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. Killing is prescribed on him, the one who insults the prophet. It is not permissible to imprison or show favor to him or ransom him. And any Muslim or non-Muslim insults Muhammad is to be killed. So I, I think that's pretty straightforward. That's that's pretty straightforward. Well, Lloyd, can I just say that part is very telling here. Just here, it's not permissible to it's not permissible to imprison or show favor to him or to ransom him. So I think even this part, the fact that one of these um, rulings is to show favor to, like the lack thereof. Ish. So this is, I think like slightly maybe a, a, a tiny factor in why Muslims, a good normal progressive Muslim is having such a hard time condemning the attacker of the Salman Rush, the attack, because to be, to be fair, he, uh, we touched on this earlier as well. I'm not saying that every Muslim knows that that's a thing because I, I surely wouldn't that, you know, if you see something wrong, you don't act on it. You're sinning in, in, your, in its entirety. But I do think that, yeah, even as I think about it now, if I was a, a Muslim that held Muhammad in high regard, I don't even want to say prophet anymore, but if I did, um, somebody who has literally done, like defamed, I mean, it sounds ridiculous to me to even no, say now. No, you see, I'm that, so is actually covered, that is covered in the okay. Sharia. Yeah, so that okay. is, I'll explain this for you from the Sharia directly. So, okay, if you go here. So for instance, this book is called Usul Al-Fiqh for the Muslim who is not a Mujtahid, who is not a qualified legal scholar. Right. Okay, this is by Sheikh. Okay, blah, 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 from the Essential Series in Islam, Essential Studies in Islam, Inside History in Islam Publications. Notice what it says here. There is no rebuke in issues of ijtihad. It is impermissible for anybody to level an accusation or criticize. So when a person does an action in the religion that is based on a valid ruling, it is not permissible for anybody to level an accusation or criticize him for it. Lloyd, you've just got and given an even better reason for why you should stay absolutely yeah. shtum on this issue yes yeah. exactly and because they know it's legal to tell people, exactly and i mean even if there's various people that do know it's legal and the most part the majority don't i still think that like even the fact that you would you know deep in your heart that that's something against your theology which which says that that should happen and also the fact that you know that if you say that what happened to Salman Rushdie was wrong your own people could turn against you now that mm -hmm. speaks volumes for Islam. That's very problematic. It's like, okay, there is this insane police-like, cult-like behavior where you can't even voice your opinion without getting shunned. But then what Lloyd has just shown goes a whole level further because it is now impermissible, therefore, i.e. pretty much unlawful, for you to say that that was wrong. Because if you say that you that that was wrong or what happened to Salman Rushdie was wrong, you are by yeah. default sinning. Yeah. Look at Twitter. You can't even, for instance, on Twitter, you can't point out, for instance, where we gay people or transgenders are committing pedophilia. Yeah. Twitter will ban you for defaming that minority. See, th this is exactly the same as what Islam does. I mean, yeah. you can see the correlation one to one there. Uh, yeah. So, in terms of Norse mythology's question, that that's one. YouTube, the way they'll ban a video that discusses jihad, but they won't ban the jihadis. Yeah, touche, exactly. You know, that's exactly the same thing. Thank you, so, Norse. Thank you so, so much. Hopefully that answers your question. So, guys, mm -hmm. if you want to get this, I mean, this is easy to find. 
Sul al Fiqh for the Muslim who's not a Mujtahid, and uh, yeah, download it, recheck it for yourself. But it's it's named black and white. I don't have to make it up. Oh, by the way, I just need to mention this guy is a uh, well-known <clears throat> atheist, and uh, he tells us. Uh, I believe this guy's a Muslim, and he's he's this guy's a Muslim. Let's just put it that way. I've been calling him a Muslim for two years, and when I when I did a show on Jay's channel discussing the what Islam calls um, what Islam calls permissible homicide. Okay, legal murder in Islam. Right. For instance, a Muslim can kill a non-Muslim. A father or a grandfather can kill a grandchild or a child. It's perfectly legal, and you can kill an apostate without penalty. When I mention that, he tell he comes on and says, "Murder is subjective, Lloyd. It's conditional on individual cultures. There is no rational discussion for murder. It's just all okay." Wow. All right. <laughs> So, so he's now defending. Now, this guy only yeah. attacks Christianity, and he always defends Islam, mm. right? So he's yeah. saying, no, no, but Lloyd, you can't blame these Muslims. Murder is okay because it's it's okay in their culture. Therefore, it's it's there's no right because it's subject. You are you are blaming them because according to their law, it's fine. So why are yeah. you giving them a hard time, Lloyd? Mm. Well, like, okay, so hopefully they'll whack him next, and then he can tell me that it's just fine. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, so let's finish on this one. Um, yeah, so, okay, now there are four levels of Islam. So we have the two divisions, right? The Sharia and the Hakika. This is only open to the Sufis. The Sufis are the highest level of scholars in Islam. They are the pinnacle. If there's a pyramid, the Sufis are on top. Mm -hmm. Okay, then you have the lower level Sufis, and then below, and, and they are in the Hakika. And then below that, you have your regular Imams and Sheikhs and Qadis. And then below that, the lowest level, the absolute, is the lay Muslim, right? So the lay Muslim follows what is called the Ibada level of Islam. This is called the literal. It is the Zahid. It is termed Islam for the masses. <laughs> the Ibada is Islam for the masses. That's the name that the scholars call it. Right. You are legislative subjects. Yes, precisely. Yeah, well put. Then you have the Ishara. The implied, the allusion, the sign, the gesture. These are the legislative practitioners. These are people who have a deeper insight. They see another level, another layer, another interpretation of the Quran. It's how it's interpreted. Well, lay Muslims interpret it one way. The scholars interpret it another way. But then the exactly. higher level scholars interpret it according to the Lata'if. Right. These are the spiritual Lots practitioners. And subtleties. Okay. Legislative and then the spirit. Well, you can say occult. Here you can yes. happily say occult. Yeah. Then the fourth level is the haqaiq, reality, truth, divine essence. These are the advanced spiritual. Now, are these I'll all Sufis some... then? Everybody here at this level? These two levels are Sufis. These are Sufis. Sufi. Okay. The highest levels are Sufis. Okay. They can say what they like. The right. Sufis are the pinnacle of Islam. Because the Sufi, the Sufi is beholden to the Sharia. He must fo fully follow the Sharia. And then he enters into the Hakika and he adds that. So he's got the full understanding of Islam. Okay, wow. So somebody just dealing in Sharia and not the Hakika is not at the level of the hierarchy that somebody, that a Sufi who's mastered both is. Correct. Yeah, okay. So Lataif is the plural of Latifa. Latifa is a girl's name. Yes, it is indeed. Yeah. So Latifa is the equivalent of the Greek um, Sophia. Okay. It's just the Arabic version of the Sophia. Mm -hmm. Now, Sophia also gives us sophistry, sophists. Yes. Right? And Lataif has, there's another name, another name associated with Lataif, with Latifa. So Latifa, if you start to do some research, and again, look, it's been like three years maybe since I've looked into this. It's been a long mm -hmm. time. It wasn't a big thing for me. And so, so this is not something I can like bring up references and show because no, but, but I've seen the links and I, I need to do research one fine day, but the Lataif is the plural of Latifa. Latifa is the equivalent of the Greek Sophia, but Sophia is also a false wisdom, sophist wisdom, fantasy, imagination, lies, mm. right? If you, if you will. But isn't that right? where philosophy came out of too? The word? True. But then you have the sophists. Remember, you had the sophists and the rationalists. You had, you had Aristotle and Plato and you have the Neoplatonists who are sophists and you had Aristotle and the sophists battling it out. Then Aristotle was like, look, we need rationality. And the sophists yeah. are, we can make shit up, basically. Excuse my French here, but <laughs> you know, we'll make it up as we go. And he's like, no, there's, there's, there's an objective reality. And these guys' reality is subjective. And there was that mm. fight. And you got the fancy words, the sophistry with the words. And you got, you got him saying, no, no, there's hard reality. Reality is hard edges, right? That, that was mm. Aristotle. 
on that fight. So, so he detested these people. Aristotle detested these people. Okay. However, what is interesting, if you start to look and you look into the, the there's a link from Latifa, the feminine, to another character called um oh good grief. Um mm -hmm. called oh give me a second. Um yeah. okay, so then sorry, I will show you now. So what mm -hmm. you have is when you when you start looking into okay, so Latifa, so Lataif is the is mm. to my knowledge right the plural of latifa latifa like queen latifa right who doesn't like her music right yes exactly latifa. and latifa there's another name that they sometimes use as well that's linked to this called the leilat okay leilat is also a girl's name okay which is very unusual but leilat is the equivalent of the Hebrew Lilith. Lilith. I was going to say Lilith earlier, Lloyd, when you said, oh, Latif. And I was like, no, it can't be Lilith. Like, yes, it is. Yes, the, it is. The woman herself before Eve, really? A demon woman. The demon Eve. woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The demon before Eve. I the woman okay. who ate babies. Right. Yeah. So the Latif and, and the Lilith. Adam's actual first wife, right, they say? <laughs> That is not in canon, yeah, yeah. but it okay. is in some of the other literature. So that that is speculated. Yeah, certainly. Okay. I mean, that is put forward in myth. But she was banished. Now, notice. Now, again, this is this is entirely going off into speculation, right? Yes, but based yes. on, but so so take it for what it is. Understand it for for what, as I as I'm presenting it. But she was banished. She's barely mentioned in the Bible. She's barely mentioned, but she is banished to the desert, to the dry, lonely, empty places, and the high places and caves. So she yeah. is banished to the high places and caves. She yeah. is a succubus, right? So now she goes into a cave and she is banished to the desert. Mm. Now, into a cave. Come on, come on. Make the connection for me, Nuria. Muhammad in a cave. <laughs> Muhammad in a cave. He has these convulsions. Taking refuge, meditating, somehow speaking to He's an angel. He's a sex maniac. He has convulsions. He's a... She's a succubus. Yeah. Sex demon. Yeah, I mean, totally so just think that. of the mythology. Just think of the mythology. Just think how that works. Yeah, because remember, there, these guys are common they themes there, Lloyd, for sure. Sorry? Yes, I'm, 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 I'm gauging a hell of a lot of common themes. Yeah, yeah. So understand now. Now look, we don't have to believe it, but the fact is that they did and they do. Yes. Right. Okay. So we need to accept that this is their mythology and this is how this works. And these things, unfortunately, do start to link up. Right. So, so just take that as interesting. As Very interesting. Yeah. I'd love to digress here properly someday for sure. But yeah, yeah we'll look into that. So let me sure. finish on this one. So understand. So there are two divisions in Islam, right? Yes. And there are four levels. The lay Muslim is at the absolute bottom level, kindergarten yeah. Islam. And not only that, so is everyone else, except for the scholars. Yeah. Okay. If you know the Quran and the Hadith, then you are at the absolute bottom level you are you are Jesus. at the abc level of islam Jeez, and here here we are most muslims well me as a former muslim thinking that wow once i've read the quran and i know enough hadith to like be able to live my life in the best way that's it i am a perfectly prime muslim to go to heaven no 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 because if the tables had been turned and you're actually living in a real Islamic country where there was real manuals followed like this, as Lloyd is saying, we wouldn't even know half of where these rules or prescriptions or what's mandated or what's prescribed for war or what isn't comes from. All we've got is the Quran and the Hadith to help us. Correct. Correct. You've either got to be a high level Sufi or you're basically only exposed to half of the religion per se. So either way, you're screwed. As a lay Muslim, yeah. I think you're only given little pittance. Like imagine yeah. Salt Bay just drizzling bits of happy Islam to keep the masses within mm -hmm. their state of opium. Like it literally, this is that. this is the Islam. For I can the... show you that within the Sharia. I can actually okay. show you that. Yeah, so, oh, please I won't do. Into, yeah. I won't go into detail, but I'm going to show you just a piece of it. Okay, sure. just one aspect of it. This is called Ihsan, the perfection of the faith. Okay, so sure. I'm just going to briefly touch on this. So the perfection of faith in Islam, okay, is now these are the these are the things that you need to do to perfect your faith in Islam, and they speak of for the scholars that's one level, and for the lay Muslim is another level. So let's have a look.
You must worship in a way that fulfills the obligations. Those are the legal rules, the legal obligations, by observing all its conditions and integrals. Like the integrals are things that are integral to Islam, like the the, the five daily the five daily prayers, for instance, right? Yeah. So you must just, in other words, just follow these rules, tick these boxes every day, and all's good. All yes. Right? But then notice here two. This is not for lay Muslims. Do this while immersed in the sea of Gnostic inspiration, Dumukashafa. Gnostic inspiration, until it is as if the worshipper actually beho beholds Allah Most High. This being the station of contemplative spiritual vision. That's that that that's a cult magic. That's not that's Gnostic magic. That was right? that's ritual is. magic. It's right? basically saying, yeah, be so Im immersed until like you have God to do actually joins spiritual you there. rituals. You have to do yeah. magical rituals to to get there. It takes years to learn those rituals. Understand? Yeah. Now you yeah. must worship, as mentioned above, though mainly aware that Allah sees one. This is the station of vigilance. These are spiritual stations that allow you to pierce the veil and enter into the throne room of Allah. Okay, and this is the most popular Islamic law manual in the world. Right, this is the most common Islamic law manual. And then notice, all three of these are of the perfection of faith, ihsan. But the perfection required for the validity of worship is only the first. So the lay Muslim only needs to tick the boxes, follow the rules. Wow! Oh my wow. goodness! So keep on reading. You read the rest. Read the rest. This is wild, Lloyd. Right? So, oh, all three of these are. Uh, are of the perfection of faith, Ihsan, but the perfection required for the validity of worship is only the first. Just be a good, appeasing, obedient, pray five times a day Muslim, don't ask questions about the rest, we've got it sorted. We know what laws are prescribed, we know how to fight war, just do we that know what and to do up. with the infidels, just do that and shut up and just say you're part of us. You're part yeah. of us, keep having babies to fight them, pass them off to, yeah. to our armies. While perfection in the latter senses, is the mark of the elect and not possible for many. Talk about discrimination, favoritism, nepotism, hierarchy. hierarchy. I was just going to say exactly. Pyramid, occultism. Talk about it all. I the thought elect. that... So even according to their fake last sermon of Muhammad's, where every... Muslim is not is not superior. Sorry, an Arab is not superior to an any non-Arab. Blah blah blah. All of that fake it's stuff. Not true. None, none of, of it matters. Yeah, in fact, even in Islam, you're just there at the bottom of the barrel. The yeah, spiritual right. masters at the top, they right. know what's going on. You just need to be in zombie mode, bowing up and up and down five times a day, doing your ritual cleansing, repeating the same like hypnotic chants in Arabic, saying those magic spells. You have no idea what you're saying. We're doing the real work up here at the top yeah. of the Sufi pyramid. Yeah. You are too ignorant. You are too uneducated. You don't know. You see, they're very polite here, but you see, this is not possible for many. So it's they're just a few, the elite few, the elite. <laughs> see. Yeah. So, so this is what they're talking about. So Muslims are practicing what the scholars call Islam for the masses, right? And that. So um, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll skip the Sharia part. I mean, the, the Ismailis are weird. Uh, sorry, not the Ismailis, <laughs> but the, the Shias are even weirder, man. That that oh, wow. the, the Shias embrace the esoteric, this esoteric mm. secret, um, occult side of Islam even more. They're more even more steeped in it. They're even more directly steeped in that. Oh, I'm not wow. going to go into that. That's actually. Um, but but notice, okay, this is interesting. I'll just do this. We'll pause here today. Okay, sure. A brief aside to the Shia. I'll do this one. This is in Edwin Berman's book, The Assassins, The Holy Killers of Islam. And he says the Gnostics held that the physical world had been created by an inferior deity, the Yahweh of the Old Testament. It was allowed a certain lat latitude until God decided to send his son to inhabit the body of Jesus. This is the whole Gnostic myth, right? To right. inhabit the body of Jesus and free the world from false teaching. Now, certain Gnostic notions passed into Islam when Muhammad adopted the Gnostic idea that the body which was crucified was only a phantom, which the Jews and Romans could not harm. Yeah. Now, now, this story, I can find at least seven versions of it. Yeah. <laughs> Amongst the Islamic scholars, I've, I've got several versions of it, and the scholars cannot get agreement. But it's yeah. all Gnostic tales from the third and fourth century that they've just copied, right? And notice, yeah, no and then, surprises oh, there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And notice Tawil, right? Allegorical interpretation, remember how the Quran is interpreted. Remember, there's four levels of interpretation now 
of the Quran. Mm. The proselyte is also taught that a prophet is known as such, not by miracles, because Mo didn't do any miracles, don't you know? In fact, Except, when they asked him for one, Lloyd, he literally cowered away for a bit and then thought... Well, 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 you see, but, but Muslims have fixed that. I'll show you in a moment. Muslims have fixed okay. that for us. Wow, okay. Thank so you, Muslims. Muslims were, we appreciate Muslims that. Kind enough to fix that for us. Thank you for I taking will... out time of your day to fix that lack of miracles no, they did of your fix prophet that for, us, for us. Fortunately, let me show oh. you, for instance... What Muslims have fixed see? that for us because we can see here the 300 authenticated miracles of Muhammad. Oh, thank you, Muslims. So this they've is gone and written for us <laughs> the 300 authentic. See, so we can read 300, long, Lloyd, not long... just one to convince you, okay? Lloyd, there's 300, and you're still not a Muslim. Shame on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so 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 a prophet is not known by that, but by his ability to construct and impose a kind of system at once political, social, religious, and philosophical. Yes. Yes, entirely. So, I mean, the more you unravel Islam, the, the more you and I chat, Lloyd, the more I get... So I started off initially thinking, okay, this is a religious ideology, and they're by, by extension philosophical. And then I started learning about why Islam was not true when I was in my own process of leaving it, and I was like, shoot, this is a complete like political social ideology like masquerading as a religion that a hundred percent and now when i speak to you i'm getting like all of these layers overlap plus an insight into how far reaching the esoteric or the kind of mystical magical realm aspects of islam is as well which i never really factored in my my default was like oh sufis and walik dervishes but knowing that sufis are also the first ones to gather the armies for jihad and also knowing that the sufis at the top of the hierarchical pyramid guarding this this very very pertinent islamic knowledge which is is de facto not available to the lay muslim is now making me see Islam in a whole nother light. So yeah, as always, I love these sessions. It just gives me, it just when I think there's no, there's not further I could prod, there's always more to go into. So yeah, wow. thank you, Lloyd. And um, yeah, it, it's a great, I think it's a great place to stop. I just want to say thank you so much to Order of the Dragon for your super sticker. Um, you're more than welcome to ask a question, but thank you so much for your support and your super sticker. And for everybody for being here last minute. Um, I do appreciate it was just like an off the cuff stream, but when I had the chance to pick Lloyd's brain on this, I will not miss it. So yeah, Lloyd, yeah. anything else you want to say before we wrap up? I uh, know that's it. So someone asked, is Islamic law? Look, Wikipedia talks a lot of crap. Remember we did the thing on Wikipedia where one guy made 65,000 oh, yeah. fake edits to Wikipedia? Oh, <laughs> yes. Them? made 65,000 fake edits to Wikipedia. I mean, man, that's, yeah. he's not the only one either, right? But sure. understand, so Wikipedia, you got to take Wikipedia carefully. Very, I'm very careful when I when I use Wikipedia. I use it when I when I think it is trustworthy, it's backed up. But a lot of the time, so no, Sharia law is heavily codified. It is extremely codified. There's hundreds of these books. I mean, not all of them are relevant necessarily, but they all say the same things. And a handful of books are canon now. So yeah. yeah. Um so yeah, guys, if you'd like to all uh, next week we can do this again next week. My week should be quieter next week a little. Um, you know, but yeah, so if you'd like to continue next week, we can plan a day next time and uh we can continue. But yeah, hopefully this has been enlightening and uh, you know, giving you sure. uh, I think it has given you lots of perspective. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, thank you, Lloyd. Lloyd, if we can have two all minutes right. of yours, I've got two questions just sure. come in now, if you're okay to um so this is a question from Richard Hoffman. Thank you so much for being here, Richard, and for your support. Richard is saying, all I can, which is literally the thought I had a couple of seconds ago, but Richard is saying, all I can think of is levels in Scientology or the church hierarchy in Christianity or the levels and levels of bishops and elders in Mormonism, etc. So yeah, that, that was where my head went to was just like the fact that in Islam, they say this, this knowledge is inaccessible to the lay Muslim. I don't even mm. think it's like Scientology, where Scientology at least will be like, if you pay enough and remove enough of the amnesia and you get zapped enough, you will eventually reach, you know, the same level of like whatever that that the top the top dogs reach, basically, right? So you'll be you'll be at the point which is transcending where you are now in terms of who you think you are. I don't know how much that that's Relevant Mormonism for Islam, is heavily but... based on Islam. Mormonism, if right. you look at the similarities between Mormonism and Islam, they're very, very similar. Um, 
Yeah, look, the thing is, there are hierarchies in businesses. So businesses are immediately Islamic too, because there are levers and there's management. Yeah, you could, I mean, there are similarities and there are differences. One also has to look at differences, right? One has to make distinctions. So, yeah, but if you look at the structure of a cult, then you're going to see, if it, you consider Islam a cult, then you can start to look for similarities again. Mm. Right, then you can look at differences. Like for instance, um, I was having a discussion with a, with a, with a not very smart human being. Well, I, well, there's lots of them that I have these debates with on YouTube. Um, they'll say, well, you know, I think these guys are just as bad as the Muslims. Now, I will say, look, I'm not targeting Muslims, right? I, I'm discussing the Sharia. Now, Muslims do practice. Some of them certainly do, but I'm not targeting any one Muslim, right? That said, they'll say, well, you know, Lloyd was showing 12 books that go into detail and all corroborate each other on how you can diddle little kids. And then they'll go, oh, these Catholic priests did it. So that's the same. And I'll say, okay, fine, hold on. Please show me where it is legal within the Christian Sharia, for, for instance, to do that. If you can just bring me the equivalent references, the equivalent books, the equivalent laws, the equivalent consensus. Right. If you can show me the exact equivalent, then we'll accept that these are they, these two are equal, right? And they can never do that. I've been asking, and they can never do that, because within Western law, that is a crime. In Islam, it is perfectly legal. It is not a crime. It is not even a sin. It is normal. It's acceptable. Do it again tomorrow, right? Whereas in Western law, those are crimes. They go against the doctrine. They are violations of the doctrine. In Islam, those are applications of the doctrine. So those are different. So understand, you can look at similarities. Yes, the same crime, but let's look at the rest of it. This is based on doctrine. This is a violation of the law. Understand, these are these are different in that sense. So this is the same crime, but the treatment is completely separate. On the one hand, it may have been covered up. That's also wrong. But that's, again, a violation of the law. It is a violation of doctrine. It is not an application of the doctrine. Whereas in Islam, that is an application of the doctrine. So that is following the law, whereas in the other one, it's violating the law, breaking the law. So hopefully that makes, hopefully that provides some degree of clarity there. Yeah, I hope, I think, I hope that answers the question. Um, we've got one more for you here, Lloyd, and then we can let you go. Um, Out Order of the Dragon, thank you so much again for your super chat. And thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed today's yeah. session. Question for Lloyd and yourself. I heard Mohammed used to wear Aisha's clothes, as in cross-dress. Is this true? Um, so yes. do you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just briefly then. So yes, no. however, if you go try and find those hadiths on most Islamic hadith sites, you'll find that those hadiths are missing. Because Muslims for the last several years have been slowly erasing that they've slowly been erasing any embarrassing hadiths. So they've been deleting them from the online databases. So the chances that you'll find them today are slim. But yes, he did. He said that he got revelation and he got the best revelations while wearing Aisha's clothes. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Lloyd said, because that's what I've read in my research is when obviously Muhammad has said, like, never have I received revelation <laughs> in the way that I did when I was wearing Aisha's dress or whatever he was wearing at the time. But again, because it has been so heavily chased after and probably potentially wanted to be shut down, when I I haven't able to like look like look into it or build a case around it enough, um, but yeah, you'll see that, that that as as quick as we're finding these really really insanely problematic or embarrassing hadiths that go against only embarrassing in the sense that they go against Islam for what it preaches in itself and its very theology. The quicker we're seeing new brackets being added to websites or we're seeing words being crossed out or we're seeing translations suddenly become, oh, so conveniently unavailable for certain websites and them hosting a very, very low mm -hmm. amount of translations. So obviously this movement is happening. We're all talking about Islam. Sources are already readily available the pushback from the islamic community is very much happening because they maybe realized this was a huge blunder quran.com sunnah.com it was a huge blunder because what is that that is ammunition for people like myself and lloyd and everybody else who thinks this this ideology is problematic because here is our yeah. proof here is our proof signed and sealed and put online by you so you can throw anybody yeah. under the bus that we bring to you. 
But really, if you start ending up throwing away Bukhari and Muslim and Ibn Majah and you want to become a Quranist, half your deen is gone, whichever deen you want to take from what Lloyd described to us today. But yeah, yeah. I hope that answers well, your question. The yeah. well, final Go point ahead. I want to make in that is that um, Islam, Islam doesn't make a separation between moral law, right? Like, like don't steal, right? Or, or d d d don't lie to your mom. Right, that's a moral law. That's not exactly in the penal code, you know. Right. That's not exactly civil law. So Islam makes no distinction between moral law, ceremonial law, like wash your hands before eating, right? Yeah. And civil law. Understand, Islam is just civil law. It is, it is the, the legal code. There is no difference. Whereas Christianity does not legislate civil law. So the mm. moral law is purely just guidance moral guidance whereas it doesn't so the judge doesn't go well the bible says oh yeah this is how i legislate parking tickets in the court see so there's no it doesn't legislate civil law islam does legislate civil law it is a religion of law so mm -hmm. there's also that difference so this is not a legal system it's not a political system islam is a political system it is a legal system and you cannot compare that to something with just the moral law versus civil law so. And thereby, I think I want to go that step further and say that's why it does not have the potential to reform or to match and kind of build itself in a pluralistic, harmonious way with the laws we have today. Because it's, as you mentioned rightfully earlier, Lloyd, it is a competitive ideology and it's competing for sheer and utter dominance. It's not competing to be the side ideology or just for its people it is competing to dominate and by extension humiliate but that's that's when we'll go further into sharia obviously yeah. <laughs> but yeah exactly that so yeah guys hopefully that was helpful and interesting and uh, hopefully the answers were sufficient and everyone's learned something so yeah uh, so, so yeah guys thank you. Saying, great, great show guys um so yeah thank you so much as well lloyd for being here i know a lot of people jumped on a bit later because the stream was kind of unexpected and if you did and you thought oh shoot i want to like watch it from the beginning which i saw in the comments by all means just rewind now to the beginning um and yeah as lloyd said we'll be doing this again hopefully at some point this week if not early next week a hundred percent but yeah thank you lloyd thank you everybody i hope this was informative yes. Till next time. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.